Say it with me now. I have no idea what I am doing. Hey guys, my name is Liam and this is Jeep Sheep TV. This is the episode where we talk about the fuel tuning for my supercharged four-cylinder YJ. Everyone keeps asking me for this video and we're finally going to do it. So we're going to get right to the point. I'm going to tell you really quickly what we're going to cover in this video and then we're going to just cover it. The first one is I'm going to just tell you how I manage the fuel and how other people are also managing the fuel. Speaking of other people, there are other people who are doing this project. Viewers just like you are doing this supercharger project and currently they are sending me photos and messages and all sorts of really cool information about their build. We're going to be showing you pictures of these builds and what that means is if you are currently doing this project, you should be sending me pictures or I guess if you want them to be shown on this channel. So how do you send pictures to me so I can share them in these videos for other people to see and just enjoy in general? That would be right here, jeepsheeptv at gmail.com. I do get pictures through Instagram and through Facebook, but in all honesty, if we all send it through the email, then I can keep track of where they're coming from just a little bit better. But jeepsheeptv at gmail.com. If you don't want to email me, you can find me on Instagram, jeep.sheep, and on Facebook at the Jeep Sheep TV page. Speaking of my different pages, I do have a store, jeepsheeptvstore.com. I am being told by some of you guys that you're having issues with the checkout. I think I've resolved that, but just in case i have a drum store if you don't know what drum is is kind of like a link tree for instagram but you can access it outside of instagram as well and you can buy stickers there i have the jeep sheep tv sticker i also have the compressor sticker which i cannot legally sell you because i'm not mercedes but if you specify that you would like one thrown in with your jeep sheep tv sticker i can get you one of those and then I have the Boost sticker, the B-E-W-S-T Boost sticker that I created myself and I can sell you. And that's available on those pages as well. So go check those out and get yourself some stickers so you can add it to your supercharged Jeep as you do this project. After that, we are going to get into some of the more boring stuff. We're going to be talking about all of the different engine sensors and what they do as far as I understand them. Hopefully, if you're more of a DIYer and you're building your own controllers or you're going beyond what I'm doing, this is going to be good information for you, or at least that is the intention. And then we will end it out with some footage of some 0-60 to 60 tests that I'm doing with the Jeep before and after the supercharger or with the supercharger off and then on so you can see what these improvements really are. With that being said, let's jump right in. Okay. The best way to show you how the supercharger works is to use it to get on the highway. Um, so that's what we're going to do in just a moment here. I just got to get past a couple of yellow lights. Yikes. There you go. Made it through. All right. You probably can't see out the window, but that's fine. You're going to see what happens down here. Boost. Watch, it's 14.7. 
85 miles an hour and I was at 15% throttle. It just would not slow down. <laughs> To start off this video, let's talk about how I manage the fuel in my Jeep. If I'm being honest with you, I wasn't sure the best way to do it, so I kind of did all of them and hope for the best as I was quickly trying to get the Jeep out to Moab, Utah for Easter Jeep Safari. Now, since then, I've been working tirelessly trying to figure out which of those methods is the easiest and which one works the best as my giant combination of stuff is probably not the best thing to tell you guys to do. My conclusion is that the most gains or the best performance I got out of any of my modifications was the Power Commander 3. If you're not familiar with the Power Commander 3, it is a piggyback system that tunes the fuel of your engine and this particular system was designed for motorcycles. I have a whole series on that talking about the Power Commander 3 how to install it, and kind of what it is and how it works. You can see that in this playlist, which I'll put on the screen like somewhere in here, but there should be links available and you can always go to my YouTube page and look for that as well. How the Power Commander 3 works is it adjusts the opening time or the duty cycle of the injectors and that then causes more or less fuel to be added because you're changing it after the computer in the Jeep or the PCM has already sent the signal. You're then sending a new signal to the injectors of what you want it to do. What I noticed with the supercharger is that I don't actually have to add a lot of fuel or any fuel at all in the lower RPMs. And this is because it seems that the map sensor is reading that lower amount of vacuum and it's still within its operating range. So it's just going to add fuel as normal as if your throttle plate was just open more. If that sentence made no sense to you at all, that's why we're going through all of this in later parts of this video. I then noticed that in the 2200, say 2000, 2200, up to almost 3000 RPM, suddenly it leaned out like crazy. And again, what does that mean? Well, in the last video, I told you guys you need to get yourself an O2 sensor and a wideband O2 sensor. What that's going to do is tell you your air to fuel ratio. So it can alert you if you are running too lean or you're running without enough fuel. That is likely what's going to happen with a supercharger as you're adding a bunch more air and if you're not adding a bunch more fuel with it you're going to be lean. And that is exactly what I was. I was very lean in the 2200 to the say 2700 to 3000 range. And when you're lean like that two things can happen. One you have no power and two you can actually start uh, causing damage to your engine because a lean mixture does run a little bit more hot. And then it can also pre-detonate, which is very harmful to your engine. So with the Power Commander 3, I am able to adjust based on RPM as well as throttle position. And so in that range, I added a bunch more fuel and you can see the fuel map on the screen right now. And you can see exactly where I'm adding that fuel. On the X axis is my throttle position. That's just how far you're pushing the pedal down. And on the Y axis is the RPM of the engine revolutions per minute. Right there in the middle, you can see it's getting a little bit higher and I'm adding a lot more fuel. Then I'm dropping it off right away and I do not need to be adding more fuel in the higher RPM range because the stock powertrain control module is adding enough fuel as necessary there. And in some cases, it's actually adding a little bit too much fuel. And we can talk more about what the map sensor is doing there, or at least what we think the map sensor is doing. The second thing I want to tell you guys about is that if you don't want to go and get a fuel controller for a motorcycle, there is another option that is working really well for a couple of the viewers who are doing this project themselves. It's the split second enricher. And what that does is it interrupts the O2 sensor signal between the O2 sensor and your powertrain control module. It's going to then change that signal. I actually tried to do this on my own with an Arduino microcontroller, and I did see success in doing so at first, and in later testing, it seems to do nothing at all. This is very consistent with some of the things I've seen with my YJ, where stuff that is somewhat intuitive, if you're changing the O2 sensor signal, you should be able to change the fuel, that's intuitive. 
it's not always working out the way you'd expect with the YJ computer. But viewers who have the TJ, which has the newer engine control system, the OBD2, they will report back to me that they've tried some of these modifications and then it suddenly works intuitively. So if you have a TJ, the split second enricher is not a bad way to go. It's not a lot more money. It's in the $200 range, whereas the PC3, you can get a used one for about $100. Honestly, as far as engine control or piggyback systems go, both are very affordable because you can really get up into the thousands of dollar range. And so it's awesome that we have these and that they are working for people. The split second enricher also has settings that you can adjust based upon manifold vacuum or boost. And so you can have it turn on only if you're under boost, which is pretty helpful. Although, like I said, I'm noticing that it leans out heavily in a very specific range of the power band, and I don't know how fine-tuned the enricher can go as far as RPM. So watch out for that. The Power Commander 3 is very good for doing things like that. Quick update, need to interrupt. I've been messaging with Grayson, who has the supercharger installed and is using the split-second enricher for his fuel tuning. He says it's working great, however, at 50% and above throttle at 3000 RPM, so pretty much what you're doing on the highway, it's going into open loop mode, which we're talking about later in this video, but really it means you're not using your O2 sensor. The enricher looks at the O2 sensor and now it is not using that loop and he's having some issues. He's afraid he might need to use a power commander or a different tuning device. So keep that in mind as you're considering the enricher. It works great in closed loop, but your Jeep is not always in closed loop mode and it will have no effect when it's in open loop mode. Okay, back to you. Send. And there it is, now it's got it. Turn on, supercharger, make sure we don't hit anybody. it goes lean when I'm completely off the throttle but I get back in it and it goes to being rich again we're at 13.9 which is really good honestly for the low amount of boost we're doing 13.9 is pretty good all right let's take a quick moment to talk briefly about you guys you guys are what makes these videos fun, because otherwise I'm just posting them for myself to watch and for me to show my mom. Yeah, specifically today we are talking about Craig, Grayson, Jake, Josh, Scott, and Stone. And yes, I have a cheat sheet over here if you're wondering. Many of you should be thanking these guys as they're doing this project. For example, Craig is the one who asked for a picture of my engine bay and a diagram showing how to put some of these pipes together. He's the reason why I released that before I could get out the pipe building video. Josh has been a huge asset as far as the tuning goes. He's the one that told me he's using the split second enricher and a few of these other guys are using it as well, but he was the first one to mention it. We cannot forget Jake. Jake bought a compressor sticker, which he will be sporting on the piping for his supercharger project. I believe he's currently tearing the engine out of his Jeep, which is crazy. So we can all wish him luck on that. And then when he gets the supercharger in, it's gonna be a heck of a lot of fun. Okay, you guys, this is the super fun and technical part of this video. We're gonna talk about all of the engine sensors and it's important at this point to remember one very specific thing. I have no idea what I'm doing. All of this information is stuff that I've inferred from taking apart the sensors or doing some brief Google searching. So if I'm wrong about this, it's okay to tell me in the comments. We're all going to learn together. This is my observation of all of these sensors and how they're going to affect the air fuel ratio 
of your engine and how you can kind of work with them to change some of the parameters. Some of these are proven, some of these ideas are more of the theoretical at this very moment. Let's go through some general terminology and basically what these sensors do. Starting with the MAP sensor, manifold air pressure. This is measuring the vacuum in your engine. If you're not familiar with why there's vacuum in an engine, how that really works is as the piston is coming down, it is pulling air with it, right? Your volume is getting larger. It's going to be sucking air in. You can measure that vacuum with a MAP sensor. That is going to be a zero to five volt signal. And that five volts is going to decrease as your vacuum increases. So right here, as the vacuum increases, so it, it's sucking more and more, and as you're creating restriction, the vacuum is getting harder and harder for it to pull air through, so it's creating a vacuum that is higher. There is less engine, or less air in the engine right here. So vacuum higher, less air in the engine. It's important to understand the amount of air in the engine because then we're going to need to know how much fuel to add to that air, which is why we're talking about everything in terms of air in the engine. RPM, engine revolutions per minute. Now, if it is pulling air into the cylinders at 1,000 RPM, and then at 2,000 RPM, it's going twice as fast, it's doing this twice as many times, it is going to be pulling more air into the engine. Okay, so per a unit of time, you're going to have more air in the engine if your RPM is higher. Throttle position sensor. This one's pretty big because this is you. You are the throttle position. Your foot controls the throttle plate. As you open up the throttle, you're allowing more air in. You're not adding air. You're really not adding anything. The engine is pulling in air. It's pulling in a set amount of air and you're allowing percentages of that set amount into the engine unless you're running a supercharger, which is a whole different story. But let's just talk about the throttle position sensor. You're allowing in more air, period. The IAT, intake air temperature sensor. I have a whole video on this. I've mentioned a few times where we talk about how that's going to affect your air fuel ratio. The Density of air is directly dependent upon the temperature. As it gets colder, it's more dense. So you're shoving more air molecules into that cylinder. And those air molecules are what are reacting chemically with the fuel. So having more of them, a more dense air charge, if you will, is going to very much affect the air fuel ratio of your engine. So as the air temperature increases, air in the engine goes down. There is less air molecules in the engine. IAC, we're not gonna talk about this one very much, but it's good to know, idle air control. This is the amount of air that is allowed past the throttle plate. There's a little bypass channel in your throttle body, and it's just going to allow air in for you to idle. That is going to move based essentially on the air temperature and the coolant temperature. If your engine's nice and warmed up, it's less likely to just stop running. And so you don't really need your idle to be as high. And I don't know if TJs do this, but YJs definitely do. If you start it in the cold, it's gonna start idling at like over 1,000, 1,200-ish RPM. And then as it warms up, that's gonna settle down to closer to that 800 to 1,000 range. So that's your idle air control. Theoretically, you can affect air fuel ratio with this, but I'm, I'm a little skeptical on how practical that's going to be. CPS, crankshaft position sensor. This is used for ignition timing. This has not a whole lot to do with our air fuel ratio, uh, but it is used for ignition timing. And I put it on here because if your Jeep just suddenly doesn't start at all and you have no idea what's going on, it Seriously, it could be your CPS, and it's a really easy fix. Um, it's not super easy to get to, but it's, it's crazy easy to fix once you get there. Coolant temperature sensor, we just talked about this. This is your engine temperature. Why is it important? It appears that the engine computer runs at a different air fuel mixture or map 
or whatever if you're not at operating temperature. So if you're not hitting your operating temperature, your optimal temperature, chances are it's running a different fuel map and it might not even be making it into closed loop mode, which we will talk about. So I personally try to not turn on my supercharger until I have hit optimal operating temperature because the system reacts a lot better if you're in that temperature. The O2 sensor, O2 sensors are, well, at one point they were a new invention, now they're really not. Uh, this is looking at the oxygen in the exhaust. So if there's a lot of oxygen in the exhaust, that means there was a lot of air and maybe not as much fuel as you want. So it's going to add fuel. This we're gonna talk about a lot. This one's really important. There's a star by it. So we are going to be talking about the O2 sensor in just a moment. So all of these sensors are the ones that I could remember off the top of my head that are existing in your engine bay. Now, there are a couple different ways that cars go about figuring out the amount of air in your engine. That's like the whole point of all these sensors is figuring out how much air is physically in the engine so it knows how to add the correct amount of fuel. Some of the more modern vehicles are going to use a MAF mass airflow sensor. And that sensor literally takes in the rush of air. Some of them even have a little spinning wheel. <laughs> it takes in the rush of air and it's measuring the exact amount of air that's coming in through the piping into the engine. It's awesome. It's a super accurate way of determining the amount of air in the engine. These do not do that. And although the MAF type system is really cool and really accurate, I'm actually quite glad that these do not do that because if you get a vacuum leak in our system, it can kind of accommodate for it versus if something goes wrong in a mass airflow type system, the engine computer is relying on this very accurate source, which is now gone and things can go bad quickly. Whereas in our system, it's really quite forgiving. And so we can make a lot of mistakes and it's okay. And that's one of the reasons why I'm totally okay with doing the supercharger project on this Jeep is how ridiculously forgiving the system actually is. Because we don't have a mass airflow sensor, the engine needs to use a couple different variables to figure out how much air is in there. You've got this vacuum. If the vacuum drops to zero, that means the cylinders are being filled all the way. That's a very easy calculation to figure out how much air you have. If the cylinder is being filled all the way and you know the volume of the cylinder, you know how much air you've got. Well, sort of. If you know that and the temperature, then you definitely know how much air you have. But is that necessarily the safest way to go about things? You need a couple of fail safes. So you have your air pressure and you have your temperature and between the two, you know roughly how much air you have. But where is that? What, what's happening that caused that? And so the throttle position sensor will then tell the computer, well, what did the driver do to cause this scenario? They can run different fuel maps based upon where your foot is on the throttle, what that's doing to the air pressure and what that temperature happens to be. Then it's going to look at your speedometer, which is the only thing that I don't have on here. It does actually look at how fast you're going, because if you look at your engine RPM versus your actual speed, that's how you can really tell what gear you're in. And then it can do things like have a specific tune for cruising on the highway, which then will probably lean out the mixture a little bit and give you slightly better fuel economy. So there's a lot of different things that the engine computer is trying to do and calculate, and they're all changing all of the time. And we're about to try and modify that. Again, I have no idea what I'm doing is really the whole motto of this, this segment is because this is constantly changing based on a ton of different variables that they've already accounted for, but we don't know what they are. And so we need to do something that is going to get us the fuel when we need it without really messing with any of that. Because all of this is good stuff. This is all good. We don't want to be messing with that. So how else is this working? Once it's determined how much air is in the engine, then it can determine how much fuel it wants to put in. And we know that 14.7 to one air, ooh, Henry's not good at this angle, fuel. 
This is the optimal ratio. This is where all of the fuel is going to be burned in optimal situations. You have one part fuel to 14.7 parts of air. That's what the engine's gonna aim for. Now, based on whatever condition you're in, what gear you're in, what you're doing, it's either going to be higher than that, which is lean, or it's gonna be lower than that, which is rich. For example, if you're accelerating, it's going to give you a rich mixture because it knows that the amount of air in the engine is about to change rapidly as your RPM increases. So it's gonna give you more fuel so that you can adapt to those changes. And again, we don't want to mess with any of that, but what it's doing to come up with these numbers is it's injecting fuel because it's a fuel injected engine. So there's three different ways that the amount of fuel can be determined going into your cylinders. You have your fuel pressure, the injector duty cycle, and the injector size. Now, from the factory, all of this is known, and so it's very easy for them to predict how much fuel is gonna go into the engine. Fuel pressure coming out of your fuel tank, I believe it might be different between TJ and YJ, but it's somewhere in the 30 PSI range, but it's actually lower at idle, which is gonna help you with fuel economy. You just don't need a bunch of pressure to keep up with such low RPMs, and so it does drop the fuel pressure a little bit at idle, but for this experiment, let's consider it to be relatively constant. The injector duty cycle. This sounds complicated, but all it really is is the amount of time that the injector is open, allowing fuel out of it. And then there's the injector size. The injector size is a physical attribute of the injector, which is when it opens up, how much fuel is actually physically allowed to come out of it. These three things can be changed. Currently in this system, we can assume two things to be constant and the computer is then controlling the third. The fuel pressure is gonna be constant-ish and the injector size, assuming that you have stock components. So the injector size, the amount of fuel that comes out when it's open, the fuel pressure, which is also the amount of fuel that comes out when it's open, and then you can determine how long you want that injector to be open for, and that's how much fuel you get if you know these two variables. So if you were to increase fuel in a system just across the board, there's three different ways you can do it. You can either increase the injector size. A lot of people get like Dodge Neon injectors or something with just a higher volume of fuel that goes through it. You can increase the injector size. And then as it runs the same duty cycle at the same pressure, you're going to get more fuel per pulse you can increase the fuel pressure. You can put a secondary fuel pressure regulator on here, which I actually did, and I'm still determining whether or not you should too. I believe you can run without it. In fact, I encourage you to run without it first, and if you run into shortage of fuel, then increase your fuel pressure, because it's, it's a modification that can either lead to fuel leaks in the engine bay, which is a little scary, or you can kind of screw some stuff up with your fuel pump, which can get expensive. It, not terribly, but it can get expensive fast. With that said, I will have a video showing how I installed the fuel pressure regulator. There's a crazy simple way to do it on the YJ, and it is worth sharing. The last one is the injector duty cycle. This is how the Power Commander 3 works. It takes the duty cycle, say, 2 milliseconds from the power train control module, and then it goes, nah, I want more, and it makes it say three milliseconds. So it just, it interrupts that signal and it changes it, and then it outputs more or less fuel based upon what you told it to do. So I made a graphic down here to help you understand this system. As fuel is coming in, it goes through a pressure regulator, which comes into your fuel injector, which has a set size, and then this right here is to show you the opening time. And so right here is, you know, if your time is shorter, you can see you get three spurts of fuel coming out. If it's longer, now you got six. If it's even longer, now you've got, well, it should be nine, but you get the idea. The size right here would then determine how much of that is actually coming out. Maybe it's, you know, each spurt is more than that. 
And then the pressure is just how much of this is packed in behind there. So as you open that up, it's gonna spray out faster, which means you're gonna get more fuel coming out. Um, having this coming out faster, maybe there's a benefit to that. I haven't seen it, but theoretically, as that fuel is coming out faster, maybe it's atomizing a little bit better. Maybe you get a little bit more of a consistent burn. So that's more of a pro towards the fuel pressure side, but again, it's kind of marginal from what I've seen. All in all, this is a great little illustration of how your engine is determining the amount of fuel it needs to add, but we're leaving out one major component. The major component is something that was introduced when we got into fuel injection, and it's something that is a little different from carbureted engines. Say with a carburetor, you estimate the amount of fuel that you need, you insert X amount of fuel, and you just go for it. If you're wrong, you're wrong, right? You don't really know. But in fuel injection, you do know. So in the YJ, you have an OBD1 system, which means you've got one O2 sensor, and I believe that's correct. In the TJ, I think you have two O2 sensors. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that one. But in an OBD2 system, it's my understanding that almost all of them, if not all of them, have an O2 sensor before and after the catalytic converter so you can estimate your emissions as well. The YJ doesn't care about emissions. Just saying. The O2 sensor is the key to efficiency and all sorts of really cool stuff. In fact, it's, it's wildly awesome what the O2 sensor allows us to do. However, when we're doing projects like a supercharger, it could be the one thing that screws us over. So I made this graphic right here for you guys as the simplest uh, understanding of how this works that I could come up with. You got your map sensor, throttle position sensor, the IAT, your RPM, all of this stuff is kind of helping you determine the amount of fuel that you're gonna put into your engine. So powertrain come up, bleh. So the powertrain control module then determines the amount of fuel, it shoves it into the engine and kaboom, you get combustion, which then gives you exhaust gases. The O2 sensor is going to emit a voltage, and this is not the same for every vehicle, but for the direct injected YJs and TJs, I believe they're both emitting one volt maximum. So there is an element in the O2 sensor that's going to react with the amount of oxygen in the air, which then creates a voltage up to one volt. That is fed back into your powertrain control module, which then uses that information to check whether or not it got the amount of fuel right. If any one of these things is not reading correctly or it's not responding in the right amount of time, or maybe you changed something or maybe it's just not as good a fuel or whatever all of that can be accounted for by reading what comes out of the o2 sensor and so if it gets to the exhaust gases and it's not showing an optimal 14.7 to 1 or whatever the pcm was actually going for whether that be more rich or lean it's going to then change all of this information to get a more favorable result so if you're in here and you're adjusting voltage values with a potentiometer or with a piggyback system or a microcontroller, it might come down to the exhaust gases. It might freak out the computer and then it goes and changes it back again. Now you're thinking, well, we're making this change so we can get back to our optimal air to fuel ratio with the additional air from the supercharger. And you'd be correct. However, in a lot of cases, people with forced induction try to run a little bit more rich for two reasons. One being, like I said, you're going to accelerate more. So you're going to be changing the amount of air in the engine more rapidly than before, meaning you're going to need a lot of extra fuel so that way it can get that air fuel ratio for the times that you're not reacting to, right? The other thing is pre-detonation. A more rich mixture is less likely to knock or to pre-detonate. If you're not familiar with what that is or how to tell if your engine's doing it, imagine a couple of, I don't know, rocks in a soup can. 
shake that up and that's kind of the sound that you'll hear coming from your engine bay that's bad that is detonation happening all around the cylinder so if this is your cylinder here all right and your pistons hanging out here you inject fuel in and you're supposed to have a flame front that starts here and billows out consistently it's important that's the best way to burn the fuel if you have hot spots in here and you have combustion here and here and here and they're all random it can be very disastrous to your engine your engine is just not built for that amount of torture it's not going to burn right it's just going to cause all sorts of trouble so how they get around that is they'll run the engine just a little bit more rich and they'll also adjust the timing if you can't do either of those things, you're gonna to have to start looking at higher octane fuel. So for this project, what I've done is I set it up to run just a little bit more rich, and then I put in higher octane fuel. Now, as I'm going on these forums and I'm reading all about what you're supposed to do when you do forced induction, these guys are talking about boost levels of like 12 PSI, and I'm running at most four, which, there's a big difference between that. Where we're gonna be running with this project is so much safer than people who are tuning their engines for high amounts of boost. That's not the same thing. So we really don't need to be running it as rich as they are. And I'm sure I'll get some kickback on this and that's totally okay because I could be wrong about this. But we don't really need to be going nuts. Some of these guys are saying they're running at like 11 to one, 12 to one. I'm gonna recommend somewhere in the ballpark of 13 to 14 to one. Honestly, you're gonna be just fine there. But if you start hearing knock, then you can start thinking about putting in 89 to 90-ish octane, depending on your elevation. Obviously those octane levels will be a little bit different. I'm pretty close to sea level. And if I run a mixture of like 50, 50, 87, 89, that's like the limit of, of me not knocking. If I run pure 89, I don't think I've heard it knock yet. But I did make sure I could hear the knock so I could tell you guys where that limit exists. Okay, we got on a bit of a rabbit trail there, but essentially you got this O2 sensor which is then feeding back to the powertrain control module and it's going to be adjusting. If you're running it a little bit more rich, it could just get rid of everything that you just did. And that is why the enricher, the split second enricher, is going to take this signal and it's going to interpret it. If the fuel is coming in at like 0.75 volts, which would be a, a relatively rich mixture, and you know the powertrain control module is, is not going to like that, it's going to change it, this guy could then send it a signal of 0.5 volts, which it's most likely going to accept and it's going to love. I tried doing this with an Arduino, and for the most part, it did work, but when I turned it off, it all ran the same. So did it really work? Did it really add any value? I guess I don't know. Now, the last thing that we're going to talk about is the MAP sensor, because you are now producing positive pressures. Before, the most you could have was zero, right? Because zero is there is no vacuum, no more air is required. No more air is being requested from the engine to come through here and you're just at zero. Now you're capable of putting in up to like four or five, maybe even six pounds of boost depending on how your pulleys are set up. And that's pretty crazy because now if your map sensor was looking at say zero to five volts of signal based upon the air pressure, and five was somewhere in the ballpark of zero PSI. What is four PSI, right? Whoa, hold on there for just a moment. What are we talking about? Zero PSI, isn't it true that atmospheric pressure is somewhere closer to like 14.7 PSI, which there's no correlation here, by the way, but I keep, referring to zero PSI and four PSI and 10 PSI and how does that make any sense at all? In this video, what I'm talking about is I am using the units of pounds per square inch. You can use bar or atmospheres or whatever you want, but I'm referring to everything as pounds per square inch 
My boost gauge also outputs in this value, so it makes it easy for me to reference this to what I'm seeing in the Jeep. Zero means atmospheric pressure. So you can imagine that this is actually 14.7 PSI. That's equal to zero. And because that's consistent everywhere at sea level, we're going to just call it zero and then anything above or below that is then positive or negative. So if we're at like a negative 14 PSI, we're actually closer to a realistic zero PSI of atmospheric pressure, but because everything around us is at that 14.7, we're referring to what's happening in the engine relative to the external environment. And so that's why we're moving, adjusting everything to that zero. So it's very possible, and I mentioned that my Jeep, as I get into the higher RPMs, is starting to become way too rich. And I think the reason being is I've hit five volts because I, I'm running at close to four PSI on the highway at 3,500 RPM. And I'm probably hitting five volts and the computer is going, well, what do I do? It's, it's way out of parameters and it's just dumping fuel in there because it's afraid that, you know, it might run out. And so what they do is you can find a map sensor off of a vehicle that has a turbo from the factory. And those map sensors, maybe their zero to five volts actually equals like 10 PSI, right? And so now it's all within range. It's all in the expected values of the engine. But when you do something like that, right? If zero to five volts used to max out at zero PSI and now it's at 10 PSI, you can imagine what, you know, 2.5 volts previously was, you know, something in the, in the negative range, right? So let's say it goes to negative 20, or sorry, ne let's go with negative 10 to make it easy. So from zero to negative 10, halfway between that would be negative five PSI. But now, 10 to negative 10 is going to be 2.5 volts is going to equal zero PSI. And that is a very, very different error to fuel ratio. There's, there's a lot more air in here than in here. And you're going to be off by that amount. So if you do change out your map sensor, it's not the only thing you're going to want to do. I assume I haven't done it yet, but I can only assume based on this, that if you change your map sensor, you're also going to want to be adding fuel somewhere in the system. And that's all fine and good. That's the next thing I'm gonna try on my Jeep is putting in a map sensor that allows for it to read boost levels, not get freaked out. And then I'll just come in with my Power Commander 3 and say, okay, for these new values, we're going to have a buttload more fuel and everything should be all fine and good. Speaking of the map sensor, there is a modification to the map sensor I've been interested in for quite some time now. And it is an adjuster that changes the voltage from the map sensor based upon modifications you've done to your engine. So really briefly how that device works is your map sensor is actually more like a variable resistor. So here's your resistor and your PCM is sending a five volt signal through this map sensor. So as you have varying pressures, as that pressure gets closer and closer to zero, or as the pressure rises, the resistance through this map sensor becomes less and less. And so if there's no resistance here, you'll get five volts over here. But if there's a high amount of resistance, that voltage level can be you know quite a bit less one volt two volt etc what this modification has done is they actually take out the source voltage from the powertrain control module and this this comes back to it by the way and what they did and we're going to draw it over here is they actually put 12 volts through a variable resistor of their own coming to the map sensor. So really they're changing this. So you're not gonna send 12 volts to you, that's ridiculous. But maybe they're sending six volts down this line. So now 
if this has enough resistance to shave off one volt, then previously it would have been four volts, but now it's five. And so what they're doing by changing the input voltage is they're going to be able to have a higher output voltage based upon the manifold air pressure. And that's pretty exciting. What that does is it takes the amount of fuel that you're going to be putting into the engine across the board and it just raises it up. Now, for this project, I do have some concerns with this because we have boost. We are going to put pressures through this map sensor that it's not used to. And so maybe, just maybe, if we put six volts in here, you get six volts out here. And that is bad. This powertrain control module is expecting five volts at most. And if you go above that, it's going to throw an engine code. And if you go above that a lot, it could actually damage your engine computer. So that's my concern with this modification for a supercharged or even turbocharged system, you could end up damaging your engine computer. If you're watching this video and you're not supercharging your Jeep, you just want to learn more about how it all kind of works, this is a pretty cool modification that you could use to increase fuel across the board if you've made changes to your Jeep. But keep in mind that in the closed loop system using the O2 sensor, it very well could just change everything back to where it was. Now we are going to finish out the video with what I'm sure you're all waiting for, the zero to 60 tests. So please enjoy these and I will see you in the next video. Okay, we're gonna try and do zero to 60. Um, without the supercharger. I'm gonna go to a complete stop in a second here. And three, two, one. I'm letting the automatic transmission shift itself. And it's shifting at 4,500. Pedal, it says I'm at 64%, but I'm definitely at more than that. Okay, we're gonna do another zero to 60 test with the supercharger on. In three, two, one. Now we're just having some fun. 